Hey, Aristocracy of HR community, Janine Truitt here. Thank you so much for reading my latest blog post, Can I Breathe? Lessons of a Stifling Leader. Um, I wanted to take a few moments to chat with you guys, nothing terribly long, um, about this phenomenon of leaders that are micromanaging to essentially keep the visibility off their employees or um, you know, maybe it's a leader that is just fearful of letting go, fearful of delegating. And so, you know, I wanted to just kind of open up some further dialogue about this topic. So, I mean, micromanagers have been around for forever. Um, it's not like it's anything new, but I think that what I wanted to hint on in this post was just this other angle um, which doesn't just speak to, um, you know, maybe someone's need to have their hands in everything, um, more of a neurotic need. It actually speaks to a more intentional um, act or actions that show where, you know, some leaders just may be having their hands in everything because of an insecurity or um, out of malintent to keep their employees down and to keep them dependent on them. And um, I just think that it's interesting that this kind of phenomenon is going on, especially in a workforce where you know people are not all the way happy with the work that they do. And I think you know the one saving grace for um, their careers at least is just the knowledge that they may be able to get ahead that they may be able to climb the ranks the proverbial ladder if you will and so it just becomes very disconcerting when you have managers or a manager um, that is immediately responsible for you who does everything in their power to stifle you to not allow you to use the skills that essentially you were hired um, for. And so, you know, this is, where is this all coming from? This is just coming from some discussions I've had with people, with colleagues of late um, who, you know, have expressed uh, great disdain for this kind of thing. And it's just kind of mind boggling. I mean, in all of the situations we're talking about really high performing people who have, you know, been in their rightful careers or jobs or industries for years. And so there's a certain amount of knowledge, skills and abilities that um, one acquires over time, you know, on top of their education that allows them to perform at the level that they do. And I just think that companies do themselves a disservice by not letting people spread their wings and show what they can do. I mean, part of it has to do, I think, with this whole idea that, um, you know, many companies are just afraid of failure. And so, you know, their cultures are like this. They, they are anti-failure cultures. Um, whereby people don't feel comfortable to make mistakes. And when I say failures, I don't mean like things that cost the company millions of dollars. Those are like big failures. Those are kind of the ones we do want to avoid. But nevertheless, um, you know, small risk taking, calculated risk taking, um, and, you know, small failures or even medium sized failures just really shouldn't be deal breakers and we shouldn't be. Um, sending the message to employees that they can't make mistakes and, you know, thereby if we're going to prevent them from making any that we don't allow them to do their jobs. Um, so I say this to say that if anything in the article resonated with you in terms of things that you've done or if you've seen them with other people, it may be time to kind of look at some training or some discussions around, you know, what are those boundaries between where a leader should be stepping in, where a leader needs to kind of lay back and maybe provide guidance and empower their employees. Because even for the neediest of employees, as I said in the article, um, 
they may need you and that's great but there's a certain level of accomplishment and sense of joy that one kind of gets out of figuring out an issue a problem and coming to that whole conclusion by themselves there's just power in that i mean the steps that get you to that point is a lesson uh, the things you had to do, the people you had to engage, the, the people you had to get on your side to champion, whatever it is. There's just so much value in that. I can't tell you how many times I've been on projects where it seemed like the odds were stacked against me because of the people that were involved and how difficult it was to win them over. And I can't tell you how much of a sense of accomplishment it gave me in those moments to know that um, I had done something or I had worked really hard to kind of solve those interpersonal conflicts or issues in order to make the project successful. So please, people, stop the micromanaging. It is 2015, and in a second, you're going to have a bunch of free agents on your hands working in your organization, all of which you handpick because of their backgrounds and because they are experts or knowledgeable in the various fields that uh, you employ. So, you know, you have to start to have faith in people and let them do what they need to do. And I'm not saying that when people screw up or don't do what they need to do that you don't step in. Those are probably the more crucial times for you to have something to say. But by and large, let people get their work done just let them get it done and and be in the background and be their champion and be the background behind the scenes support. You know, you need to be that director behind the camera that's basically, you know, kind of leading them down corridors, but not exactly telling them what to do. So I hope that you got that message from the article. I hope you like it. Please share it. I am Zarina of HR on Twitter. And I am at Zarina of HR on Instagram and Periscope, which I'm just now kind of figuring out, and also Snapchat. God help me. I don't even know why I'm on that, but I'm there too. And uh, again, thank you so, so, so much for reading my articles. Um, and if you're brand new to the aristocracy of HR, welcome. All right. You guys take care. Bye.